Sabbe satta bhavantu sukitatta bhavantu sukitatta Hello, I'm Dharmasar, and I'm here with the first episode of this analysis and commentary on Bhikkhu Katukurunde Nyanananda's book, Concept and Reality, and which he very modestly subtitles, An Analysis of Papancha and Papancha Sankasanya in Early Buddhism. Now, I say it's a modest subtitle because actually this work is far more than that. He has actually delineated the entire high-level view of the Buddha's teaching as given in Theravada suttas through the lens or the prism of this concept of papancha. Now what exactly is papancha? Well, different scholars translate it differently. It's another one of those words like sankhara, which is extremely important to the significance of the Buddha's teaching, but it's very difficult to translate into English, especially by using one word. He eventually settles on conceptual proliferation, <laughs> which is quite a mouthful, but it really describes the meaning or the essence of papancha. Other translators use synonyms like obsession. Yeah, obsession is probably the best one. <laughs> but uh, they don't really get the same uh, essential view of the term that conceptual proliferation does. And especially Papancha Sanya Sankha is like an avalanche of this conceptual proliferation, which overwhelms the person who began it in the first place. And there really is no English term for that. So, he begins his work by mentioning that it's kind of difficult to uh, interpret this word papancha. It's an integral part, though, of the context of the suttas. And without some understanding of it, the suttas would be rather incomprehensible. In fact, he leverages the understanding of this term papancha to understand the whole of the Buddha's teaching up to enlightenment. So let's look into this. He begins with an etiological analysis of the term. And he goes into many of its synonyms and so forth like that. Well, we're going to skip all those details, but it's enough to say that the word papancha itself appears 74 times in the suttas. And in various compounds, it appears 101 times. Papancha Sanya Sanka appears 14 times. So this is quite a significant distribution of the term in the suttas. And this indicates its importance, but it doesn't really uh, reveal how significant this term is and how necessary to a proper understanding of the Buddhist teaching it is. In the West, we talk about Papancha and Papancha Sanya Sankha in glowing terms as creativity and focus and brainstorming and uh, inspiration and so many others uh, that kind of overlook the pernicious side, the obsessive compulsive side of the phenomenon. And what we don't realize is that it is a key part of the whirlpool of speculation, the uh, vortex of uh, generative thought that results in becoming. And of course, this is extensively explained in the suttas in regard to paticca samuppada, or dependent origination. But what we're going to do in this series is look into Papancha itself. And that 
it really occupies such an important place in the Buddha's teaching, in the Theravada suttas. So, for example, there are several references that Jnanananda brings up, especially the Sakapanha Sutta. I'm going to read the relevant quote from that. That desire, sir, what is the source and the cause of that? Indra is asking, Sakka is asking the Buddha, what gives birth to it? How does it come to be? What, being present, is desire present? And what, being absent, is desire also absent? The Buddha answers, mental preoccupation, ruler of gods. This is the source, this is the cause of desire. This is what gives birth to desire. This is how desire comes to be. Wherewith our mind is preoccupied, for that desire arises. If our mind is not so preoccupied, desire is absent. The source, ruler of gods, the cause of our becoming preoccupied is what we may call obsession. This is what gives birth to preoccupation of mind. This is how that comes about. If that obsession is present, our mind is preoccupied by the idea by which we are obsessed. If it is absent, it is not. So this is a very nice explanation in terms of Paticca Samuppada. The principle of Paticca Samuppada is basic causality. When this is, that is. And when this is not, that is not. And this is applicable to a wide variety of phenomena. In fact, all conditioned phenomena, because they are caused. They are conditioned. And the factors that condition them are the cause of their arising. So whenever we see any phenomenon from subatomic reactions to the whole universe, we know there must be a cause. And that cause, when present, causes the phenomenon to arise. And when it's absent, it ceases. So the cause of obsession is mental preoccupation. In other words, the cause of papancha sanya sankha is papancha. <laughs> That's actually what he says in the original Pali. This obsession, this uh, preoccupation with certain objects of the mind that leads to desire, uh, this fantasy, this creative visualization, this uh, involuntary concentration or focus of the mind on a certain object is actually the cause of so much suffering in our lives. And we don't realize it. But we think it's something good. Oh, I got a great idea. I couldn't sleep last night. I was so engrossed in thinking about it. I was so inspired. <laughs> because what is this inspiration? It's passion. So when we get a great idea, then we, our mind becomes passionate about it and a flood of thoughts ensues over which we have little control. In fact, sometimes we feel like it's coming from outside us. You know, maybe it's God or maybe it's some other external cause. But actually, of course, it's simply a typical function of the mind. The mind exists to protect us. It's from the good old days when we were hunter-gatherers in the forests and we had to watch out for all kinds of threats. Now, our life is so much more secure. So the threats have become much more subtle and more or less imaginary. But when we perceive a threat, when we perceive something that could cause problems in the future, maybe, we tend to worry about it, and worry is another kind of papancha, another kind of conceptual proliferation. I think the Dalai Lama, <laughs> he put it very nicely once. He said, if something bad happened in the past, it's over and there's nothing you can do about it. So stop worrying about it. And if something is going to happen in the future, it hasn't happened yet. So there's nothing we can do about it. 
So stop thinking about it. <laughs> the only things we can do something about are in the present. So it's better to simply wait until things show up and then deal with them. And we'll know what to do when that happens. We don't have to think and plan and fantasize in advance <laughs> in order to know what to do when it does. Another area where the power of papancha is revealed is in the area of conflict. We talked about obsession, but that's within an individual. What happens when the same thing happens between individuals? Well, it becomes often conflict or other types of interpersonal passions. So in Madhupindika Sutta, the Buddha describes this very nicely. He says, in response to a question from a wanderer of what sort of doctrine do you have? He says, the sort of doctrine, friend, where one does not keep quarreling with anyone in the cosmos, with its devas, maras, and brahmas, with its contemplatives and brahmans, its royalty and common folk. The sort of doctrine where perceptions no longer obsess the brahman who remains dissociated from sensuality, free from perplexity, his uncertainty cut away, devoid of craving for becoming and non-becoming. Such is my doctrine. Such is what I proclaim. Well, the wanderer who asked the question wasn't too satisfied by this reply. But later on, one of the Buddha's monks came and questioned him to explain it further. And the Buddha replied, if, monk, with regard to the cause whereby the perceptions and categories of objectification assail a person, there is nothing there to relish, welcome, or remain fastened to, then that is the end of the obsessions of passion, the obsessions of resistance, the obsessions of views, the obsessions of uncertainty, the obsessions of conceit, the obsessions of passion for becoming, and the obsessions of ignorance. That is the end of taking up rods and bladed weapons, of arguments, quarrels, disputes, accusations, divisive tale-bearing, and false speech. That is where these evil, unskillful things cease without remainder. So in other words, when the obsession with a certain thought becomes a matter of relationship with other people, what usually happens is some kind of conflict. Another reference given by Jnanananda is the Kala, Kalahavivada Sutta in the Sutta Nipata. And this is very interesting because this is another answer to a question where the Buddha is asked, how does form, bliss, and dukkha come to cease? question is, for one in what state does form cease to be? How bliss and dukkha come to cease as well? Please do you tell me how these come to cease? For this we would know. Such is my intent. And the Buddha replies, neither one of normal perception nor yet abnormal, neither unperceiving, no cessation of perception, but form ceases for one who has known it thus. Conceptual proliferation has perception as its cause. Now, like many of the suttas in Sutta Nipata, this is very deep, and it's a more or less literal translation from the original poetic Pali. So it's a little bit hard to understand. And we'll be getting into these very, very abstruse matters of perception, name and form, personality, and the various obsessions, conceits, and other imaginations that go along with them later on in this series, because they're quite intricate subject matters. And I don't want to try to explain everything right in the beginning before we have laid the proper framework. But there's one more a very important reference that Jnanananda gives. And this is in the Aniruddha Sutta. The Buddha asks Aniruddha, 
about what are the thoughts of a great man. And Anuruddha gives a list of seven. After he gives his list, the Buddha replies, well done, well done, Anuruddha. Well have you pondered over the seven thoughts of a great man. That is to say, this Dhamma is for one who wants little, not for one who wants much. For the contented, not for the discontented. For the secluded, not for one who is fond of society. For the energetic, not for the lazy. For one who has set up mindfulness, not for the laggard therein. For the composed, not for the flustered. For the wise, not for the unwise. But, Anuruddha, do you also ponder over this eighth thought of a great man? To wit, this Dhamma is for one who likes and delights in Nipapancha, not for one who likes and delights in Papancha. So Nipapancha is the antonym of Papancha. It means non-proliferation of concepts. So I remember the first time I met Bhikkhu Nyanananda, and he summed up this entire book in three words. He said, in his very innocent way, <laughs> Nibbana is non-conceptual. Boom. It hit me like a brick. In fact, I've spent basically the last year contemplating this succinct statement, which is actually a, a great truth, especially given the modern obsession with intellectual interpretations of the Buddha's teaching. Now, the Buddha was a very intelligent man. There's no doubt about it. But his actual discovery was something beyond concept beyond intellect, beyond words and symbols. It was an experience, Nibbana. Nibbana is beyond perception and non-perception, being and non-being. There's no way to express it. You have to experience it for yourself. I was chasing that experience, but not meeting with the success that I desired until Bhikkhu hit me with this sledgehammer. Nibbana is non-conceptual. I sat back. I went into a trance. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. It was as if he had physically struck me. Because I think uh, since beginning my studies of Buddhism up to that point, I was operating under the unconscious assumption that Nibbana was something that could be approached through concepts. And yes, it can be approached, but it cannot be experienced through concepts. You have to take a leap into the unknown, into the unknowable, the non-conceptual world. And when I say non-conceptual, I mean not only absent of words and symbols, but also absent the kind of symbols, the specific kind of symbols that are presented to us by the senses and the mind. Pre-verbal thought is just as much symbolic and just as much a model of reality or a symbol of our perceptions than words. And a good example is a child upon seeing a ball for the first time. Huh? Take a little baby, you give him a ball, you put it next to him on the rug. At first he doesn't know what to do with it. He has no idea of it. So what does he do? He'll grab it, put it in his mouth. <laughs> well, it's not very good to eat. And maybe he'll drop it or throw it, and then it rolls. And he sees, oh. You can do that with it, and maybe he pushes it, and it rolls some more. Oh, great fun. I can cause an effect, you see. And so the uh, 
conceptual proliferation begins. But to give you a very graphic and also entertaining picture of what Papancha is and how it operates, I'd like to play a little film clip for you from an old favorite movie, The Sorcerer's Apprentice from Fantasia. And I want you to notice one thing, how toward the end, when all the brooms are carrying all the water, Mickey gets caught in a whirlpool. And this is exactly what happens in Papancha Sanya Sanka. So watch and enjoy. Sabbe Satta Bhavantu Sukitatta Bhavantu Sukitatta 